So thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining us tonight. And, and uh, thank you um, so much for, for Lynn and Zhao for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, tonight, um, um, I'd like to talk about visualization and mental imagery. Um, you know, my background is um, both uh, come from academic uh, using mental imagery in my uh, school. So I and my undergrad in kinesiology, my master's degree, as well as my um, PhD courses in, in visualization. Um, so I do have a bit of a background. Actually, before we go any further, can everyone see my screen that I'm sharing right now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Excellent. Yes, no problem. Okay, so I'm just going to change this. So you should know before we go any further, I'm, uh, I believe very strongly in the power of sport and, uh, and particularly in the power of skiing. You know, I think it can create tremendous meaning in our lives by the challenges that we create and give ourselves and push ourselves to improve our performance. And then as a result, how that inspires others around us. And uh, so for that's my deep seated belief. And one of the reasons that I um, speak to you tonight and why I've become so involved in sport. Second, I think to use mental imagery um, that we should set goals before we start. So for those of you familiar with the CSIA, we have four different levels. Um, the first one obviously being uh, the introduction and teach a lot of beginners. And then the top level, which is a level four, which I currently evaluate and examine, um, that takes people um, sometimes their whole careers before they're successful at. And so if you have, a, if you're a CSA member or if you have uh, ambitions to, to get a, a certification, whether it's with the Canadian Ski Instructors Alliance or another uh, association around the world, um, I recommend that you set those goals now. I, I think it's important that you write it down with pen and paper and that you try and make those goals, smart goals, wherever you can. So make them specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. There's some great programs. I won't get into much detail other than that. But there's some great programs that are out there that can help you with your goal setting. Um, and I recommend you do that before you jump into a visualization or mental imagery program. Mm -hmm. So what's, uh, what that'll help you do by setting that goal, it'll help you determine if your motivation yeah, is exactly. intrinsic. So is that you just, you love the feeling of pushing yourselves and having a challenge to improve or as an example or extrinsic so maybe <laughs> to get that blue pin or that the blue pin is the level four pin in the CSA or the new uniform, you know, the CSA uniform to be uh, recognized as a level four, which is a more of an extrinsic goal. And so it's important to figure that out to see where you're motivated. Uh, so in terms of the learning outcomes that I'd like to achieve tonight, um, I definitely would like to give you a definition, a clear definition of mental imagery and visualization. Give you a little bit of the history of it so that you understand kind of where it comes from. And then um, obviously there's some characteristics of good mental imagery that we'll talk about. And then I'll provide you with some examples and we'll actually try to do some mental imagery tonight if everybody is game for it. So um, many of you will have seen athletes, you know, at the top of a race hill and you can, with their eyes closed, either leaning on their poles or sitting on the ground and you see them bobbing their heads, you know, and they're moving their hands as they go through a course. Um, you know, this is them going through the rehearsal, their mental imagery of the course. And so this skill is, uh, is critical for, um, to be successful at the highest levels. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. I first became introduced to mental imagery when I was actually in high school. Um, my coach, my ski race coach back then introduced me to the idea of visualizing the course before I went through, but I was very inexperienced at it. So as a result, it wasn't as effective for me. But then through the courses that I've taken over the years, I personally have found it to be the most significant skill that I've developed in helping me achieve my level four, especially in the off season. And so I'll talk to you more later on tonight as well about my experience and how I help myself improve my own mental toughness and preparation for the exams. And then by the end of the night, I'll give you the chance to ask questions, but please you know, write it in the chat. And if there, uh, if there's a consistent um, question that's coming up in the chat that uh, everyone seems to have because I, there's a, a concern, please stop me. Otherwise, we'll just wait until the end um, so that we can get through the slides and then I'll answer all the questions that we get. 
so yes, in terms of you know definition of of visualization and mental imagery, you know, research has shown how powerful it is um, in terms of allowing us to have an impact on our performance. But it is a skill like any other skill, and we have to develop it. We have to remember that we're going to start as beginners and become better and better at it over time. So I'm going to ask that you open your minds and uh, and and we'll talk a little bit about um, you know how that process went. For myself so it took me three years before i really had a tremendous impact from visualization in my performance but the way that we'll look at it tonight visualization we'll think about it as five senses incorporating as much as we can not just the idea of picturing it in your brain but also feeling it seeing it and the impression that you have the emotion that was there as well we want to change for the better so making sure that when we are picturing it that we're picturing a positive uh, improvement so to give you a little idea of the uh, history of um, visualization and mental imagery, it really has been around since, uh, you know, really throughout history. So early cultures had versions of mental imagery. They had components of it. Um, <clears throat> and those components included, uh, you know, picturing and visualization as a part of their religion. Um, but also as a part of their culture. And then through uh, philosophy and medicine, particularly the Greeks, um, but also Asian um, philosophers used visualization and mental imagery. And then they incorporated it into their medical practices throughout history as well. Um, as we got into the 19th and 20th centuries, it was rejected by Western medicine. And then as a result, a lot of the um, um, medicine and cultures around the world rejected it as well because it wasn't scientifically proven. Um, and then as we've moved into the 1900s, and it was about 1960 when athletes started openly talking about mental imagery as a practice and visualization, that it really was super effective in terms of helping them to be successful. And you know, for them, that was really a game changer. And so yeah, through the early part of the 19th and uh, 20th centuries, you had Freud and Jung both supporting this concept. And then it became incorporated into, into uh, clinical psychology as a way to help people recover from trauma. And so now we see you know, imagery used on that side of things in terms of helping people to overcome things like uh, PTSD, uh, to overcome other challenges in their lives in, the, in their therapy. And we also see it being used in sport across the board. Pretty much every gold medalist in the last since the 1970s has incorporated some type of visualization and imagery into their training. So the way to improve the effectiveness of your visualization. So it's you know that whole idea of can we use it to become a better uh, athlete. So Billy Jean King was one of the most high profile. Um, uh, participants and users of, of mental imagery. And what she did was she actually promoted it uh, in the 1960s. And then by the 1970s, it became much more widely used and it became more sophisticated. So they started to realize that if they incorporated some of those other components, not just the image of it, but also those other things like emotion, uh, like their technical or tactical approaches, um, then that really helped them develop. I want you to think of mental imagery as weightlifting for your mind. So it's really training your mind to get prepared for that peak performance. And so if you have plans to go on the level four or the level three, I think it's important that you incorporate the mental imagery in order to be effective. So it does need, so ways to improve the effectiveness, for sure it needs to be individualized. You wanna create your own image. You don't want to take too much from other people's experiences. So what I've found works the best is if I take, and the research has actually demonstrated this as well, if I take, if you take from an experience that you already have and you try and reinforce the positive things that happen, that's the most effective imagery that you can do. So some people will try to Im imagine moves that they've never made before. It's not as effective as if you're, you have actually done it and then you reinforce it. So this can be done in any sport. It's been shown in everything from piano to basketball. 
through studies um, done by uh, large universities around the world and publications. There's been thousands and thousands of publications around mass telemetry, and you can find those online easily. And what they do is the key is that once you've performed it properly, if you want to reinforce it, the key is to then picture yourself having done it properly over and over and over again. And then when you're under pressure, like a, like a level four or a level three exam, you'll be able to perform at that level and even under the stress because you've reinforced it with your imagery. And that'll in include incorporating things like your the emotion that you have. So it, it really does mean that it's a mental state that you want to copy. So for myself personally, when I was preparing for the level four exams, what I did was I imagined it happening perfectly over and over and over again. I was skiing perfectly in the scenario that I was in. So it was at the level four exams, wearing the penny at the top of Mount St. Anne, going down the steepest run. I could tell you which way the sun came up. I could tell you the smell of the um, beaver tail at the bottom. I could tell you how it felt to get on the gondola and the way it swung on my way up and all the things that I would see. And then I could tell you how the snow sounded in different conditions and, you know, the wind on my face and the tension and the feeling of the emotion of everyone around me. And I would reimagine that over and over and over again and picture myself performing under that pressure uh, perfectly over and over again. And that reinforced, and that was the biggest difference in terms of me being successful. Um, I had done trips to uh, Mount St. Anne and Tremblant for years and, that, and as well as out West training and training and training. So it was about a 10 year process to get my level four. And what I found was that the mental imagery that I did and that imagine, imagining all those emotions coming up and then how I was gonna deal with them was the best thing that I could do. So, you know, it needs to include that goal orientation that we talked about at the start. So this is a picture of my brother, Steve, and my younger brother, Mark, who are both level four examiners as well. And this is Chris O'Gain, who a couple of years ago passed. Uh, this is before COVID, obviously. Uh, and he passed his level four, and this is a, a level four pin. And so you want to picture yourself passing. You want to picture yourself getting, holding that pin in your hand and, this, and the satisfaction of when you're successful. And if you include that as a part of your imagery, um, then that'll promote that acceptance and that positive attitude towards the, the goal itself. So we also need to try to, uh, when we do create this individualized imagery program, um, what I recommend is, uh, you know, uh, taking three or four times a, a week where you take 10 to 15 minutes maximum, where you find a quiet location and you sit down and you picture the um, run that you want to do. So in skiing, I like to think of each run on a level three and a level four exam or even a level two as its own sport. And that way in my mind, I have it clearly differentiated between uh, short radius, my bump run, my race run, you know, uh, all of those different, com different uh, performances that I have to make. Because, you know, at, at the Olympics, there's, you know, bump skiers don't participate in the GS, right? So uh, I like to differentiate it. And then with each run, I have specific keywords that I will repeat as I imagine it. And I use this in my regular skiing as well. When you wanna perform at a high level, you can't have a big paragraph in your head of what you're working on or else you ski slow and you ski mechanical. If you have a one word cue and a, or a single tactic, then you're much more effective in your performance. So what happens, the human brain can only have seven things on their mind at any given time. So that's why we have phone numbers in North America with seven digits. And so with that, that capacity of our brain to have all of that different stimuli, all of that different information coming in, if we have too many things we're trying to do when we're skiing, plus we have to take in the snow conditions, the people around us, you know, the wind, our, how our skis are performing, all of those components put us way over seven. So when you wanna perform at a high level, I recommend getting a single word that you repeat to remind you of what you wanna do, but to try not to judge if you're doing it. And I also recommend when you're doing your imagery to do the same thing. So you just repeat that word over and over and over again. 
The other trick that I recommend, I want it to be positive all the time. So that means if you picture yourself falling or if you picture your performance not perfect, that you should stop. Picture, I, I then picture a stop sign coming up and then I would take a break, open my eyes and then I go back. But always when you do your imagery, I recommend you do it um, sit, sit, sitting down, not lying down. I recommend that you do it with your whole body to allow yourself to move around a bit. And I also recommend that you try to, uh, whenever possible, um, uh, reinforce those, those uh, challenging situations and overcoming them. So we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a few moments. So how do we incorporate the five senses? This is a big question because it needs to really have all of those elements in, incorporated. And the key is, the next time that you're at your um, at the location where the exams are going to be held, is you try to take some notes on what the things you notice are, because you're going to be back in that exam environment. Here in Ontario, when you're doing your level three or your level four, typically you're going to be at Blue Mountain or Devil's Glen or Craig Lee. These are kind of our regular locations. So you'll want to go there and kind of get a feel for the lay of the land. Check out, you know, where the lifts are, where the steeps are where the bumps are, where you'll be evaluated. And then when you do your imagery, you want to include some of those elements. So there'll be smells and there'll be sounds and there'll be, you know, the chairlift will look a certain way. And that the sight lines of when you get to the run that you're going to ski off on, you know, whether it's the trees or whether it's the way that the hill kind of um, changes its fall line, all of these pieces are important. So not only when you're visualizing, then you can, you can, you can visualize the things that you heard when you were there, the things that you saw, even the taste in your mouth, the, the, how it felt in your gloves and how your feet felt in your boots that day. Um, if we can incorporate all of those different components as well as the emotions that you felt. When you're standing at the top of a hill and you're about to ski down uh, and you have uh, a group of 20 or 30 other people also standing there, their emotion and their energy bleeds into your experience. And so that changes how you're feeling. And so it's important that you picture those emotions and you picture how uh, you would feel at the top of a ski off run when you're doing your imagery. So one of the other components of, uh, of mental imagery or visualization that I recommend is to make an automatic correction, okay? So that's, um, so it means that if you make a mistake, it's no problem. And actually in the CSA, we want to see people push their limits and make a few bobbles, especially in the bump run on the exams. We want you to push it a little bit. Not being perfect is okay. And I think people sometimes think that it has to be perfect. We actually just want to see the recovery from the mistake or from the bobble. And so you can picture yourself doing that and then having success and so what's important is the self-talk that you do when you do that imagery. So after you have practiced it over and over and over again perfectly, then incorporate some weird things. So uh, my uh, coach, I, I worked with, uh, my imagery coach was a PhD in sports psychology. She was also the national team coach for women's rugby. And uh, her name was Natasha Wesh, and she worked at, the, at Western University with me. And she took me through a session where I pictured a gorilla coming out of the trees and jumping on my back during my ski off run. So it was totally ridiculous. It could never happen, but it was one of those scenarios that I would never picture. And I pictured it happening. And then I, I pictured what I would do. And I decided I would just ski down with him on my back. And it was funny, but it was memorable. And I'll never forget that moment when, because it pictured it so clearly in my mind. And the year I passed, um, the, one of the back buckles on my boot popped right off my boot in the middle of a run, just blew right off. And I felt it and I saw it go, but I kept skiing. And it was because I had that experience of practicing. How was I going to react when something went wrong? And sure enough, it did go wrong. And I was able to overcome it because I had pictured it going properly or how I was going to react when something didn't go perfect. So one of the things that I, I, I believe strongly in, in terms of improving our effectiveness of imagery, is that if you do make mistakes during your picturing, that you take some time to, to journal. So it's, it, 
Um, in mental imagery and visualization, unlike physical training, it's tough because the results aren't as tangible. We can't measure it like a ski race and say I was faster that run or I, you know, my technique was better. Um, so what I recommend is you write down how your uh, session went. You know, were you able to do it in the time that you had permitted? Did you have to stop at any time? And then when you log these down, you can kind of go back and look at how your performance improved and, and write down those positive and negatives and then the problems that emerged and how you overcame them within your imagery training itself. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna do an imagery exercise. So before we do that, so that simulation training, you know, picturing it perfect like I talked about and then picturing it going, going wrong and then how will you respond? I'll give you one other example of a situation. So I was in the middle of my level four exam teaching and I had an individual that was a part of the group decide that they needed to change skis in the middle of my lesson. And we needed to go all the way to the top on the gondola and I was planning on going on a chairlift to another section at Trombla. And, I, and she was out of it, she needed new skis, she wasn't comfortable. And so I stopped my lesson, <clears throat> took her over and I got her skis. And everyone was looking at me to see if I was going to lose my cool and, and get angry. And I didn't because I had pictured crazy things happening like this. And I was ready for it when, I, when it did come up. So another example of how you can do that. Okay, why don't we pause really quickly here. I'm just going to, are there any questions that have come up before, to, at this point? <clears throat> Okay, we're going to do the uh, the orange wheel exercise. So, what I want you to do. Um, so, the first time I was exposed to this exercise, it was with Brick Janik, who is an Olympian and former Canadian Alpine ski team member, um, and she taught me this in 2008. And she was taking me through what she was doing at the time in terms of her mental imagery practice, and so. I want you to, so in a minute, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and we're going to do a simulation of, of mental imagery. So <clears throat> get as comfortable as you can. And slowly, I want you to close your eyes. Now, I want you to imagine you're in your kitchen. You can look around your kitchen, notice the appliances. Now I want you to see a bowl of fruit in the room. So there should be a banana, some apples, an orange in the bowl. Now slowly walk over to the bowl of fruit and pick up one of the oranges. Hold the orange in your hand. Gently squeeze it. Notice how soft it feels and how bright the orange color is. You can decide if, this, if the peel feels smooth to you or if it feels rough. Now I want you to peel the orange. Reach in with your thumb, start to peel away the skin and it peels away really easily. I want you to notice the juice is running down your fingers. Now lift the orange up to your nose and smell that zesty aroma of the skin of the orange and break it open and separate each part of the orange. And now take a segment of the orange and put it in your mouth and notice the sweetness of the orange, how it feels on your tongue and chew the orange. Now continue to eat the orange until it's all gone. All right, now open your eyes. So just by a show of hands, how many people were able to um, uh, picture the orange well, just by a show of hands. And then how many people were able to taste the orange? That's a tricky one, sometimes incorporating taste. 
And then how many people, uh, keep your hand up if you're able to chew it all the way to the end until the orange was finished. So you can kind of get a feel for, it's, it's you know, imagery is a skill. It's not something that you are born being able to do. And it takes some time to develop. But I find because you're picturing yourself in your own kitchen, that's something that's very common that you go to every day that you see all the time. And then it, maybe you don't like oranges or maybe there's another fruit that you like to eat. But going through this exercise can really develop your imagery skills. Okay, we're gonna try another exercise now. So I want you to, again, you're going to close your eyes and I want you to picture yourself arriving at your favorite, at the bottom of your favorite ski resort. And so you're ready to, to ski. <clears throat> you have uh, your ski gear all on, your boots are done up. You feel a sense of excitement. Your body is starting to vibrate. You look around, there's people gathering, there's a small lift line. You see the chairlift or the gondola, and you start to make your, you walk your way over to it. I want you to notice the trees and the environment, if it's snowing or not. Now, are you standing um, in the lift line? You get onto the lift. As you get onto the lift, you notice the sunlight, warmness on your face or on your mask. You can picture it as a cold day or a warm day, as a windy day or not windy. This will be up to you to decide. I also want you to notice the noises that you hear, whether it's the gondola or the chairlift moving or people talking or the sound of people skiing by. So now you've arrived at the top of the chairlift and you're sliding over to this to the run it's your favorite run at that resort as you get close to the crest of the hill you stop for a second to look around and a few people ski by you can hear the sound of their skis on the snow you can smell some beaver tails now slowly you're going to push yourself over the edge of the crest of the hill. And as you push yourself over the crest, you're going to hear the sound of your skis edging. You're going to picture yourself going slowly at first with perfect technique. You're in control. And I want you to picture this from over your own shoulder. So you can see your body position and then you can see the hill in front of you. You're skiing your best now, and you're starting to increase your speed and your confidence is growing. And as you make your way down the hill, you're skiing faster and faster across the hill, not down. You come to a stop at the bottom of the run. You feel a deep satisfaction. You just skied your best. So this type of exercise, um, once you get uh, confident in doing that over and over again on a hill that you know very well, then you can take yourself to the hill where you would do your exam or to the hill where you would be doing your peak performance where you needed to, whether it's the bump run or the race run at the resort that you probably will be at, you want to incorporate all of those different pieces because it simulates and prepares you for the exam scenario that is coming. Okay, we're going to do, uh, we got through this pretty quick. We're gonna do one other um, simulation. So we're gonna do exercise number three. And I'm gonna do a progressive muscle relaxation, visualization process for you. So um, you can kind of maybe just stand up for a second and stretch, uh, get out of your chair because you're going to sit back into your chair and I'm going to, um, you're going to get very relaxed very quickly. All right, stretch out for a second, stand up. <clears throat> so visualization and mental imagery 
can be sport specific, but it can also be used as an effective tool to help in any aspect of your performance. So within skiing, right, we look at technique, you know, I haven't really talked at all about this uh, CSA technique tonight, but obviously that's a big component and there's lots of great material out there. There's tactics. So imagery can help you improve both technical or tactical. It can improve your, um, you know, your psychological state, you know, it can help make sure that you feel confident in your, um, your physical environment. And then you can also help you in terms of your emotional um, and even just confidence in your equipment. You know, the example that I used around um, how my binding blew apart, I also had a situation where my ski came off during a race run. And then uh, in one situation, uh, and then it threw me off for the next race run because I wasn't prepared for that to happen. You know, it's out of your control. You hit a rut and the ski pops off. It wasn't something I could have prevented, but I didn't deal well with it and it affected my performance later on. So the key is when you're doing your imagery to prepare for that <clears throat> by picturing it going wrong and then right away picturing you're feeling confident, you overcame it, you put it behind you and you moved on and then you performed really well in the next run. Okay, so we're gonna do exercise number three and this will be the last exercise. So I want you to get back into your chair and get as comfortable as you can. And so what one of the big components and in, in a very important uh, aspect of peak performance is sleep. And so when I was preparing for my level four exam, I was uh, working, when I first started it, I was a senior manager on Bay Street. I was working at a major bank and I had a very stressful job with lots of direct reports. And then I was doing it as a hobby, kind of part-time on the side. And so I was sleeping, you know, three hours a night and it was not effective for training. It, you know, we need six to eight hours, especially if you're pushing yourself physically very hard. Um, the average person, not everyone, but most people. And so what would happen was I would wake up in the middle of the night, having dreamt about skiing, and then I couldn't fall back to sleep. So I'd sit there and I'd be anxious and I'd be worrying. And so what I started to do was, through my mental imagery, when I would wake up, I would picture myself relaxed at the exams, calm. Um, I'd picture a stop sign if I started to let my mind started to race and go into how I was going to um, perform on that exams. And it was really effective because it allowed me to get back to sleep. The other thing I incorporated in terms of helping with my performance and helping with sleep was to incorporate a component of um, progressive muscle relaxation and visualization beforehand. So uh, I want you to get as comfortable in your chair as you can. You're gonna close your eyes and slowly, I want you to take a deep breath in and hold it one, two, three, four, and slowly out and let yourself relax. Another deep breath in and hold it. One, two, three, four, and slowly out and relax. Feel your body melting into your chair. You're warm and relaxed. Now slowly, I want you to picture yourself lying in a field of grass under a big oak tree. You can smell the fresh cut grass. You can feel the warm sun against your skin. You're calm and relaxed. There's birds in the distance and a small stream at the bottom of the hill. Slowly, I want you to look up into the sky. As you look up, you notice some beautiful white clouds slowly rolling by. And each cloud represents a thought or a feeling or a worry from your day. You're gonna notice that thought or feeling and then just slowly let it slip away.
So now you can open your eyes slowly and relax. If you need to stand up, you can. That um, imagery exercise that I just did with you, typically I would do that um, before going to sleep. And I actually do that with two of my three children every night um, to help them fall asleep. And it's amazing. The only thing that I changed that I didn't do with you just now is I say, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to feel energized and ready to take on your day. And that's the only thing that I do differently other than what I just did with you now. And uh, it's remarkable. It really helps you get right into a deep sleep. Um, and then it helps them in terms of sleeping longer, which uh, for my seven-year-old who has some anxiety, it's amazing. So you can get those. There's lots of recordings online. You can get them on Spotify. You can get them on you know, iTunes, lots of different locations. Uh, but the progressive muscle relaxation ones are also really effective for athletes. Um, and for skiing, that's key. So it's, you actually just stretch, you feel your, your um, part of your body flex, and then you hold it for 10 seconds and then you release it. And that process also um, is very effective in terms of helping you sleep and also helping you recover at night. Because it's that time when we're sleeping that helps our muscles reform, helps our brain in terms of learning. So if we're learning new things on the snow, that'll help incorporate it better. And so that's a really important one in terms of uh, effectiveness for helping our, us achieve peak performance. Yeah, I've been talking a lot. Are there any questions before we move on here? Uh, so earlier, Jenny had a raised hand. Jenny? Okay. Jenny, do you still have a question? Hi, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's no question, no. Okay. Oh. Yes, thank you. No problem. Can I have a question? Sure. Yeah, I think that your visualization is very helpful and uh, really appreciate uh, your uh, explanation, uh, but I uh, have a quick question because I notice uh, you also wear glasses, right? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I try to realize uh, I don't wear glasses, but uh, look like it doesn't help. I just wondering if you have any experience to share every people uh, wearing glasses uh, during the ski, how to fit glasses into the goggles. Yeah. And make you comfortable. And because for myself, when I wear glasses, is definitely affect my performance of the skis. Yeah, it, and um, so I, I'm actually, I wear glasses to read, so I don't have to wear them when I'm skiing, thank goodness, but my brother Steve, who is uh, an inner ski member, so he, he went to inner ski to represent Canada twice now, he has glasses inside his goggles. And so what he's done is he's bought a prescription that's very um, narrow, so it fits inside the goggles. So what he's done is he's bought a very, very small size and then they fit inside um, and that's his solution. But he wears his, his glasses all the time now, both for reading and for skiing. And uh, I think it's, yeah, if you need them, you have to be able to see clearly um, when you're skiing because of this, especially when you want to increase your performance and increase your speed. Because if without any visual reference point to things like bump or things like uh, ruts in the snow or even where there might be ice, then you're not going to be able to ski as fast or or as uh, be as uh, increase your performance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, when I go to the bumps, uh, I need to see very clearly. Yeah. So I think probably it's a small frame, small size frame glasses and uh, big size uh, of goggles. Probably yeah. is the solution. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. And take your goggles in when you go to get it and explain to your optometrist, this is what you need because they'll be, they'll find a solution for you. Even if it's a children's frame, uh, that way it'll fit. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Jason, there's a question from the floor. Sure. Um, someone uh, asked me thinking about thinking during sleeping made people more excited or more nervous. <clears throat> Uh, which will uh, influence sleep. Um, could you say it one more time, Joe? Okay. Someone asked a question, thinking during sleeping made people yep. more excited or more nervous. So that will influence the sleep. 
So is that how that interfere with uh, the imagination? Yeah, so, so I think both emotions are good as long as you stay asleep. So when we're in REM, when we're dreaming, we're actually, um, it's very easy for us to wake up because we move. So if you've ever watched someone sleeping, they're moving when they're in REM, their eyes are twitching and their body's moving. So it's easy for us to wake ourselves up. So what's important in your imagery is that you picture yourself controlling that emotion so that when you do sleep, because sleep and, and dreaming is not that different from imagery, but if we can actually simulate ourselves controlling that emotion, not letting it get um, away from us, then we will continue to sleep. If it gets away from us, then it stimulates us too much and we wake up and then we lose the benefit of that learning. It's not ingrained, right? So our neural pathway, you can visualize it like a trench. So when you're learning how to ski, your old, you know, your old way of skiing is a big deep trench that you have had for a long time. And you can picture the neuron firing an electrical impulse going along inside that trench. When we have a new way of skiing, we make a change we get a little ditch. And so the neuron's starting to run on it. And then if it gets difficult, it jumps back into the other neuron and, and keeps going. So when we have a new feeling in our skiing or we have a new approach, we're able to make a new movement pattern. When we're sleeping, that becomes integrated and we build a deeper trench. If we're woken up in the, in the night, then we, we don't get this, the full benefit of that learning. So that's where I, I would recommend you know, feel those emotions, they're good, but feel them and also have them in control. So don't let them get too emotion. Um, Cause what happens is our brain, we have uh, the prefrontal cortex is the front of our brain. And that is the part what makes um, difficult decisions and problem solving and creative thinking. And when we get under stress, we go into what's called the vagal nerve, which is at the base of the brain. And the vagal nerve is kind of, if you've ever heard of fight or flight. So it means like, am I, I'm afraid of what I'm going to do. So am I going to run away or am I going to stay? And so that when we get into that part of our brain, then we don't make good decisions. And it's purely adrenaline rushing through our veins or cortisol, those bad hormones, and those negatively impact our performance. So it's important that we, sh when we do imagery, part of that imagery is control of emotion. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. And now, so from my um, personal experience, I think Jason had mentioned uh, make a, a positive imaginary. That's very important. When you're thinking something, like you're thinking you're the best run um, in the last few days, and then when you're thinking that you reinforce positively, Actually, you'll be happy you have a good, good uh, sleep, right? You're happy you uh, yeah. wake up with the satisfaction. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's so true. Um, I, use, I use the example of golf. So Tiger Woods has used imagery in his golfing since he was four years old. And when Tiger picked, right before Tiger, make, Tiger makes a shot, he pictures it going perfectly right where he planned to send it. And sometimes he pictures it going into the hole. And he said in interviews that the times where he had a hole in one, he pictured it going into the hole beforehand. So it's the same thing in our skiing. We want to picture the perfect run, skiing absolutely at our best. Now, I've, I've heard of a lot of people watching over and over and over again, good skiers online. Unfortunately, that hasn't been shown to improve our skill. Now, if you were to watch your own skiing, and that's where I recommend you get someone to take a phone and follow behind you, even just one or two turns, because that's the way you should imagine is from behind so that you can see the terrain and you can see how your, your body moves as you ski down. And so just like Tiger Woods, picture it for your best possible run um, on the, the hardest terrain you've ever skied and picture it going better and better and better. And that will help you improve. Yeah, just a uh, quick we question. We have two for... people. Uh, Sorry, we have two uh, people raise his hand. Sure. Who who's that? Uh, Brian um, here. Um, you okay, it. go ahead, Brian. Yeah, Jason, you you touch you touch a very good point. Um, my my daughter plays competitive golf. Um, her coach mentioned about same envision. Um, 
the ball fly envision where you want to go first. And yeah. a lot of mental idea you talk about in reinforced by her coach and mental coach, so on and so forth. Uh, the difference, I, I, what, what I'm trying to get at is <clears throat> when you mentioned about um, envision prior to you go sleep or or, or be prior to the day of your, when you plan to go to your level three, for level four exam. Yeah. Um, that leaves a, to, I mean, to, my guess is that's going to leave a whole night gap. And, and then the next day morning, um, when you're on the hill, um, are you just follow, just follow what you, you need to do? Or are you thinking what you, you need to do prior to the night? Or are, are you reorganized? Are you trying to reorganize your, your thoughts before you go down the hill again? That's first number one, first question. Yeah, yeah. So let me answer that one. So yes, so on the day of, when, so I, I just competed in the Powder 8 Worlds or um, Canadian Championships. And my brother Mark and I were lucky enough to play second and we were selected to go to the World Championships. Now that was canceled because of COVID. So I was pretty upset. But what I, on those tryouts at the Canadian Championships, I pictured it the night before as best I could. And then on the day of, while everybody else was talking and nervous and I was picturing it going perfectly. And I picture that run that I was about to do in the powder with the sun, with that pitch that's right in front of me. I closed my eyes and I pictured the feeling of it going just perfect with a couple of keywords. And then I would also incorporate a song to cop because my mind was racing and I wanted to have like a relaxing, like something that would make me almost dance down the hill. And so that was the other tactic that I would use. And I found both very effective and I've used that for years. So even you'll hear me humming when uh, we're doing the demonstration run of the level three and level four exam, I'll have a song in my head and I'll kind of be singing it to myself in my mind, just keep loose. So that's uh, another strategy that you can use, but for sure you want to picture the night before, but you want to, it's a great way to stop yourself and keep yourself focused on the task is by picturing right before you do your ski off. The other recommendation I make is look at one course conductor who you like and you have a similar body to, watch them perform and then don't watch anyone else. Uh, I see it all the time. One person falls on a bump run and then the next three people fall or have a bad run. <laughs> and it's because they watched that person and they got nervous or they got in their head. So you, you tend to emulate or copy the person that went right before you. So that's one other suggestion I have. Uh, you had a second question? Yeah, that's very good. Thank you, Jason. Uh, second question is relating to the difference between golf and ski in terms of the, uh, I don't know if you do meditation or what. Mm -hmm. um, some people or golf coach or mental coach recommend meditation. Uh, five, 10 minutes before going to the bed, uh, calm yourself down uh, with certain tools. Um, that's a very competitive way. I mean, that's for a very competitive um, sports preparation, right? But for skiing, um, do you recommend the similar type of tool? Or do you, is that something you think it's effective as well? Or, or what's the difference? Is yeah, if that's the yeah, well, actually, I think skiing and golf actually are very similar in that uh, they're individual sports. And I think depending on your mindset towards skiing, if you just free ski, you know, you're just trying to go and try new runs and, and get better for the sake of getting better. That's one thing. But if you're trying to achieve your CSA level three or level four, you're, you're an athlete, whether you like it or not, in order to be successful, you need to have all the components that an athlete has. So I'd say there's almost no difference. The only difference I would say between golf and skiing is the level of intensity. So when skiing, when you're imaging, there's gonna be a uh, high intensity, but longer duration. In golf, you know, one swing, high intensity, and then break, right? And then refocus. So there's a, there's a very specific moment of contact with the ball. And then you obviously, after that, you have a large break between. Whereas in skiing, you run could be as long as two or three minutes long. So you need to maintain that focus throughout that run. And that's why in your imagery, it's repeating over and over each turn. Okay, you know, stay low, stay low, stay low, stay low. When I have a word that I repeat in my head, a lot of the time it means it's nonsense to the rest of the world. So I'll say, 
you know, when I want to go fast in my short turns, I say, go slow, 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 slow. And for whatever reason, that results in me skiing very fast. So it doesn't have to make sense to anyone else, but I do recommend when you do your imagery that you have a word that you repeat. Very good. Thank you, Jason. Um, now that you mentioned about the, uh... You mentioned about the uh, job you were at Senior Manager in Bay Street, now you're full-time. So you're telling me I cannot get my level three or four without quitting my job. Are no, you? not at all. Not at all. What I'm saying <laughs> is um, I, 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 I couldn't do it, but I think you can. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm just joking, Jason. I'm, I'm, I'm older. older. I, I'm sure I'm older than you. My I just find, I, I mean, the, the difference between the uh, golf and ski, you, the, you, you, the, touch, the point you touched base with is very good. I think the, uh, the, the think box and play box with golf applies to ski is a bit different because ski, you got a longer duration of execution rather than a thinking box. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Okay. Next one, Lulu. Actually, Brian, Lulu can answer that question. Lulu is working full time. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the another <laughs> job, I not got his level three. Oh, good. Okay, so you can do it. You and can I'm do planning, it. And I'm planning to do my level three where I'm working for time in a hospital. So that's my go to you. Lulu, nice. it's your turn. You can use your imagination. Imagine you, you can achieve two goals <laughs> at the same time, right? <laughs> achieve that goal in the dream. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jason. Uh, this is Lulu. Uh, thank you for your time of, uh, of today. It's, uh, I think what I got the most thing is uh, I, I'm used to use this imaginary uh, in, my, in my brain when I'm off the slope to, it helps uh, help me a lot in the a, in a tactical, tactic part, I know. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I got the most from you is um, to which extent this exercise or training, imaginary training should go if you aim for, let's say level three or level four, that level of uh, uh, performance demand. What I'm, will be interested in the next would be, um, what's the example of uh, how this imaginary exercise or training helps the technique skiing techniques you, yeah. you said that it will be common follow so I would, I would be wanting to see it yeah and it, it can the research around technical improvements um it's not as conclusive the research around a reinforcement of technique is very conclusive so if you've been able to so i'll give you an example uh you know in the ski turn we want to uh, get grip high up in the arc so we want to spray the snow off the side and so if you know if you have done that you're on a steep hill and you were able to get good grip when you did a certain thing if you imagine that specifically over and over and over again it will improve your technique when you get to that pitch because you're you're you will have muscle memory right now our muscles don't remember anything it's the neurons in our brain right those neural pathways that are reinforced and deeper and deeper so, you know, I think it really can improve technique and it can improve your performance when it comes to the time when it really matters and it can reinforce it. And the studies have shown, so uh, when we ski, we all, with whatever skill we're developing, so it could be wedge turning to, um, or, you know, creating, uh, turning the legs underneath the body, something like that. Uh, so turning the, leading the, uh, with the lower body is say the skill that you're trying to develop. If you picture that slowly at first over and over and over again and leading with the lower body and making the feet turn under the body and the skis staying parallel, if you picture that over and over again, when you go to do it on the snow, you will see an improvement in your performance because we all go through initiation, acquisition, consolidation, refinement and create variation. And everyone, no matter who you are, even Michael Jordan in basketball, when he learns a new skill, he has to go through those five stages. Now, Michael Jordan probably goes through very quickly because he has other experiences to draw on. And so when he learns a new skill, he might be out of initiation acquisition after five minutes, whereas some of us may stay in there longer. You can increase the speed by doing mental imagery. If you think about skiing and how much time we actually are on a steep pitch 
and the number of turns that we get before we stop here in Ontario, it's very short. And if you added up all the minutes, you know, if you skied all day long and you were training, say you were teaching a group because you're an instructor, how many minutes of actual um, challenging skiing on challenging terrain where you're performing at a high level did you do? And the answer usually is a very short amount of time. And usually it's under 30 minutes. So if you think about it, 30 minutes, how many days did you ski this last winter? And then how many minutes did you actually ski in the terrain that you're gonna be evaluated on your level three or level four? When you break that down, it's a very small amount of time to improve your performance. So that's where I think imagery can be really effective in terms of bringing yourself to the next level. Yeah, true. Um, I actually, I, I can use myself as an example during the lockdown between, uh, between Christmas and the, to the mid of February mm -hmm. at home. What I really do was, um, spend about half a, half an hour a day before my uh, routine training, I'll do like imaginary movement, like, uh, maybe during what's the transition would like to be. Yes. And I found it's really, really helpful because uh, after after about one and a half month without going out skiing, I actually find myself improved for that yes. part that I've been, I've been imagining, you know, uh, we call it brain skiing. It really helps. I'm glad to 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 hear from you. That, uh, there's a theory backing backing that up. So yeah, yeah, and it's no, yeah very true that the in in Ontario we we have uh, such a short slopes. So yeah, this this kind of training will really benefit us. It does. It does. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I also I think it it's important to emphasize as a. The, the level of a focus you should do. Like uh, mm -hmm. your imaginary training, those drills, those exercises, it has to be uh, up to a certain level. You know, maybe you, you focus as long um, to the length of um, a typical run. So that, that's really helpful because it's, it's, it's very easy to lose focus. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And that's where the stop sign is important. If you lose focus and you start, your mind wanders during your imagery session, you know, write that down. You know, I lost focus or I didn't pay attention. And then next time you shorten it, you know, only do four turns. And did you do it perfectly? Okay, good. Next time I imagine it, I'll try and do 10 turns in a row that were perfect. Yeah. 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 And, and you brought up a good point about exercises too, because even your drills, if you have a drill that works really well, so maybe it's hockey stop and it like reinforces, if you picture yourself doing hockey stop over and over again, it'll reinforce those movement patterns and it's called kinesthetic um, imagery. So because you'll actually, the joint itself will start to move in your body. It may not make the full movement pattern, but something like a hockey stop, you'll feel the pressure on the outside foot if you, you can imagine it and then coming to a complete stop having all the pieces that you want. If you're first starting imagery, sometimes that's a good way to get it started is with a drill that you do all the time because drills are usually a little slower and uh, and they create a certain movement pattern and a certain feeling. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, Jason. Jay, I have another quick question. Can I ask a question, Jason? Sure. Yeah, I think that this is a visualization or imagination is a very, a very good tool. Uh, it's very uh, brand new to me, and I think mm -hmm. it's very useful. I'm just uh, wondering uh, if uh, uh, we go through the woods, uh, what kind of critical things we can visualize or imagine before we go uh, through the woods? Because for myself, it's a little bit challenge to go to the go through the woods, a lot of the uncertainties, unexpected things in from the earth. Uh, uh, it's probably is a very challenge to ima imagine or visualize something. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you share something with us? So sure. So the first thing I'll say, because if I understood you correctly, it's like glade skiing or skiing through the trees, you know, that to me is, um, is a very 
uh, challenging environments, probably one of the most challenging environments that we ski in. And the reason is because you have, you know, fixed objects, even when you're in the bumps, at least the bumps are usually soft, maybe not here in Ontario, but you know, usually there's some soft bumps in there. But um, with the trees, so the first suggestion I'll have for you is, um, actually, I'll challenge you. Well, I'll challenge you first. So I want you to do your best right now. I don't want you to picture. So do not picture a pink elephant. Whatever you do, try your best not to picture a pink elephant. No looking at a pink elephant. What are we all looking at right now? We're all picturing a pink elephant, right? So whatever you focus your attention on is generally where you're going to go or what you're going to do. So it's very important as you go into the glades to not, to not, to not focus on, uh, on the trees themselves. So what you wanna focus on is the gaps between the trees. You wanna focus on where you wanna turn. What's the spot? And glade skiing is, you can think of it almost as skiing in points. And it's the same in the bumps. You want to ski from one point to the next point. You don't want to think about what your body's doing. It can't be technical. It needs to be tactical. So what line, What? where do I want to go? And then you just say, I'm going to turn there, and then I'm going to turn there. And then what I recommend when people first get into the, into the trees and into the glade skiing is that they try to just stop on top of a bump, stop in a rut on the bump or in the glade between the trees, just to prove to themselves that they can. And then they slowly increase their speed as they go through. But, uh, but yeah, glade skiing is very challenging, but it's also one of the most fun because most people don't go in the glades. So you can get some really good snow, especially late in the season in the glades. Um, and so that's my trick. And that's similar advice I would give to people who are first starting out in the bumps and learning how to ski moguls as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's very good. I heard the same thing. Just focus on the gap between the trees. So don't focus the, uh, the tree itself, because if you focus the tree yourself, you will hit on the trees. Hit the tree. <laughs> yeah, just uh, focus the gap between trees. That's exactly. Yeah. Yes, but uh, in the trees, uh, uh, skiing in the trees is uh, a little bit challenging, but because uh, for the bump, right? If uh, something is... Uh, uh, speed is fast, so you can find some way to slow down. But the, in the trees, the woods, probably is very challenging to slow myself, at least myself, so my slow down. So yeah. a, a lot of the pause, a lot of the breaks, a lot of the stops uh, for me in the woods, sometimes it, it makes me a little bit frustrated. I want to continuously go through the woods, go yeah. to the trees, but uh, well, it's a challenge. That's... Yeah. yeah, that's good that you're challenging yourself. Just keep at it, you know? Picture yourself, if you can do the imagery of a, a tree run and when you're going through, but picture it going in slow motion with total control and picture yourself. So the way to slow down in our skiing, right? We have, we can either skid or we can turn more, right? So if, if we turn back up the hill, that'll slow us down. But I recommend in the trees that you use a little bit of a drift or a skid at the top of the turn, decide where your skis are going to point, and then go down into the bump or into the trough wherever you're skiing in the trees. Usually it's bumps in the, in the troughs in the east. Um, in the out west, you know, the glade skiing, it's powder skiing. But uh, here, I would say what I try to do is I do a little bit of a skid. So it means I have to have flat skis, and it means that I have to be very careful, but I use that skidding to create friction on the snow to slow my speed down before I go into the trough or try and pick my line. So, okay. and, I, and before I start, my trick too in the glades is I pick my first three turns. So I say, I'm gonna turn there, there, and there. And then I push off and I don't think about it again. And the whole time I'm trying to create my eyes look up, look to the next spot. I'm gonna turn there and there. And I don't think back to say, did I turn? I just keep fo forcing my eyeballs to go up to look at the next spot I want to turn and ahead and ahead and ahead. And that's the, that's what I find is really effective when you get into the glades. Okay, cool. Uh, Thank next you very much. One, next no one, Lily. Excuse me, uh, I have to run until okay. I'm going to put you as a chair person. And okay. Jason, thank you so much for the sharing. Thank and you. One Lynn. tip's really helped for me if I just finish a uh, bump you know, bumps, because I, I really have struggling in bumps. But if I finish it well, I did not really, you know, run for the next turn. I just 
stay there and look back and give myself some applause and yeah. savor the happiness. That really helped for me. Yes, yeah. you have to celebrate your successes. And because yeah. if we if we jump to the next thing, oh, I want to work on this next run, then we don't build confidence. And confidence and and self-efficacy is what the scientists call it, but it's the belief that you can do it. If we don't take the time to uh, celebrate our successes, like you said, then we don't actually carry that self-confidence. The next run we come down in the bumps, we won't have it, or even the next year. So it's that's great that you were able to realize that. Yeah, just smile it, savor it, and enjoy the success. Yeah. And yeah, and also I watched a movie called Peaceful Warrior. It's talking about be mindfulness and be focusing on the this moment. Mm -hmm. That is really a, a you know a quite inspiring. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I have to run and you yeah. guys just enjoy your time and thank you so much, Jason, and thank you everybody. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks. Um, next one is Lily. Hi, um, thanks. Um, Jason, um, um, as I'm waiting for my turn, and uh, I think you touched a lot of the details that uh, address my question as well, but I still want to ask is the, uh, as I follow you for the beginner, uh, when we're doing this uh, three exercise for the imaginary, and I think um, perhaps everybody uh, at the beginning have the same issue that like me, uh, so I was able to follow your um, um, instruction and, uh, and a picture, uh, the scenery, and, mm -hmm. but in the middle, and then you got distracted and that clear picture just goes away. Yes. And then you try really hard and try to bring that picture back to carry on. So that kind of force yourself and, uh, you know, I use lots of strengths. So I want to ask you, number one, is whether you have been experienced this before uh, when you first starting this approach? And second, what is the uh, methodology that you've been using? Uh, is it because the repetition uh, over time's training that helps to uh, pick up this? Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. And I should have uh, explained it, actually, because that ha that's a very common experience for people. Um, especially if the imagery session is long, because our minds aren't trained to have that amount of focus and be able to picture it. It takes a lot of mental um, energy to do it. So what I, I think the most important thing when you do lose it, if you lose the image and it falls apart, it just stop and then open your eyes and then restart and just try and shorten the length of time or shorten the imagery session that you're gonna do. And, that, and then have some success. When you have success, you go a little bit longer and you make it a little bit, uh, and then challenge yourself a little bit more, whether it be make it more vivid or incorporate all of the pieces that I incorporated by the end. That was a very advanced imagery session with, with emotion, smell, taste, you know, touch, all of the senses were in there. So that's pretty advanced. That will take some time. So have patience with yourself, keep it simple at the start and then make it more difficult. I ski a lot with uh, JF Bilyeu, and JF is the ski school director at uh, Mount St. Anne, and he's an inner ski uh, member. I think he's been three times. And JF, when he skis, he does the same thing. He goes as fast as he can, and if his technique falls apart, then he goes a little bit slower. And if it still doesn't work, he goes a little bit slower. And then when he gets it, he goes a little bit faster, and a little bit faster, and a little bit faster. And if you've ever skied with JF, it's very, very fast. So that approach can apply to imagery as well. So just go a little bit more um, challenging, a little bit um, more complex in your imagery. And if you lose it and it falls apart, that's okay. It's the learning. Now go back to more simple picture it, build your confidence, and then uh, improve as you go along. Any other okay. questions? Yeah. And um, Jason, tell me whether I understand right. I found if I imagine my best run more, usually um, at the beginning when you had the best run, you, you usually only have a few turns, right? But if I do the imagination to think more and practice in my mind more, I found the next time when I go skiing, 
I can do a little bit more the best run I had. So I found that's a pretty, a pretty practical. But if I imagine a uh, U-turn in my imagination, it didn't work that well because- No, just... <laughs> no you can't imagine someone else. It doesn't, yeah. you know, it's, and, and that's why I always laugh when I see how many views there are of video online, right? Of good skiers, because people are spending hours and hours watching somebody else ski. What, what they need to be doing is watching hours and hours of themselves ski in their brain. Now, you know, watch a video and then picture it in their brain and that will help them improve. Especially if you picture yourself in your brain with a, with a goal. So maybe it is to go a little faster or maybe it is to ski down a longer run, like uh, to go to a big resort and be able to ski from top to bottom at, uh, you know, down S at, at Mount St. Anne or Super S, um, you know, these long hills that are very steep. And that'll build your confidence because when you go to ski in Ontario on a short run, even though it's steep as well, it'll feel easier. Any other questions? That's great. Well, hi. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hey, my name's Kai. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your imaginary uh, this session. It's really helpful. Uh, you know, normally I think I was always thinking about myself dreaming uh, skiing like uh, those kind of uh, YouTube, uh, you know, uh, nice skiers and uh, uh, dreaming of us like uh, uh, skiing on the, um, on the first track and then, you know, carving like this way, that way. So, yeah. well, your, your way is, is really more realistic about thinking ourselves, looking at our uh, videos, I mean, to, to improve ourselves. So that's really good. Um, so my question actually is not related to this. It's more of, um, you know, we do, we do drills, we do runs. So how would you recommend us like, uh, you know, when we have maybe 20 runs a day, how would we allocate our runs? You know, how many of them will be drills? How many of them will be the real runs? And, uh, or we can do drills the whole day and the next time we will do the runs. So is there anything that you could recommend us uh, in a more effective way of improving? Yeah, yeah. so when, when we, um, a drill is meant, a drill is not real skiing, you know? So my attitude as a coach, I've coached skiing for 25 years and I, I coached uh, competitive athletes and I've also helped people prepare for their level four exams and level three exams for years, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the we need to have in every day time to take the new feeling you get from the exercise and bring it into your skiing, regular skiing. And it's called deliberate practice because if all we do is the exercise, then the, that doesn't, that's not actually skiing, right? And so when we go to work on, when we go to ski, that new feeling, we won't necessarily be able to incorporate it any better. So what I say is once you get the exercise, and you achieve the objective of the exercise. So for bracage, you know, uh, it's skidding, right? So can I keep skidding the whole way down? And do I have a plan? And do I keep rhythm? So once you get that, then you take that into your short radius skiing on the pitch. And you say, okay, did I keep the rhythm? Did I have, you know, a little bit of a slide and then some grip? Did I have all those pieces that I had in my bracage? And if you don't, then I would say, um, go back to the exercise. And, and try it again, build your confidence with the exercise and then try and bring it into your skiing. But always, always, especially um, the mindset should be bring it back into real skiing. And so just like in a, in a lesson structure, right? So in any good lesson in the CSAA, we wouldn't pass anyone if they just did a, the whole session was one exercise and they never tried to put it back in their skiing, right? So for me, that's the most important thing is that the reason we do the exercise is so that we can bring it into our real skiing and try it in different environments. And that that exercise is to get a new feeling. So when I get a new feeling, I picture a bottle and I pour the new feeling in the bottle and I put the cap on and I put it inside my jacket. And then the next time I'm in a situation similar to that and I want that feeling in my skiing, I take the, I picture the bottle coming out and taking a drink of the bottle and then I'm able to do it. It's just a little trick I use for imaging to get that old feeling that I got from my exercise. Okay, great. Absolutely. I agree with you. You know, 
I, I was also, you know, uh, doing some drills in the beginning and then I start enjoying my runs. And then, you know, sometimes I do forget about those drills. But uh, as you mentioned, you know, if you do more drills and then those become part of your skiing, right? So it yeah. is uh, your, <laughs> in your genes, in your memory, and then you, you can carry on with that skills. You know, you can start a new drill and to, to get a new skill. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. All right, thank you very much. I just want thank to confirm you. this part. Yeah. Um, is there any other questions? Um, time is almost there. Uh, thank you very much, Jason. Thank you so much to spend the crystal time with us. I know it's still crazy CSA now, <laughs> it's a lot of things. And then tomorrow morning, I have like a CSA uh, Ontario board I had an emergency meeting tomorrow, nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for everyone. Um, I think I, I know most of, of, most of, most of you and then, um, Unfortunately, we don't have that much skiing in the last season and hope we'll have a good time next season. And then if you have any question, um, you can send me, um, we watch, uh, we'll, we try it and then we um, do send me, uh, may I ask you if they have some more questions? For sure, yeah, yeah. please send them along, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. Thank you, Joe, for organizing this. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, for organizing. Yes, this was great. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Just wondering, is that possible to share your uh, stressors? Sorry, there was a bit of background noise there. Uh, could you I think someone wants to sh um, ask whether we can share um, the, the video. We'll, we'll see. The, yeah. The spreadsheet is the presentation. Yeah. Oh, someone wants to ask whether you can share the presentation, the PPT. Yes, for sure. Yep. So uh, you can send to me and then I made a, made a copy of the slide and then okay. send out. Is that okay? Yes, for sure. Okay. This I found it uh, that's very helpful. Um, you taught me, you briefly taught me a few years ago, right? So I started yes. to use that and I found it's work, really working. Um, oh, good. Yeah, I've always, I've, um, um, how to say, I always imagine that my best run and I yep. feel, oh my God, I did really well, right? <laughs> so I feel okay. And then sometime I feel I did really well then people take video on me and I say oh my god crap this is not good unless <laughs> I think that's good yeah yeah you know it doesn't so it's more important that that you feel confident you know yeah that's that's the most important thing it's not um you know not important what the video shows to me um I don't think that's as uh, critical as it is for um you know, your, uh, even if you, because when it's almost like when we hear ourselves speak, when I watch my video of my self speaking, I hate it. Right. <laughs> and I see all the mistakes and I don't like the way my voice sounds and I go on and on, but it's better. Trust, trust that it is better. You know, you, that's uh, so important because we can, you can, whenever any, any of us watch our video, we don't think it's very good. <laughs> it's, it's I very think common. someone, really don't want you go. Um, there is one called the Huawei P20 has one more question. And I also okay, saw sure. Lulu raise uh, his hand. Yep. So Huawei first. Okay. Um, Huawei asked, some people practice ski very slow, some like fast. Do you think mm -hmm. which way is better? So I think when you are 
trying to get better. And so if it's not perfect, you need to go slow. And once it gets better, you go a little bit faster and go a little bit faster and a little bit faster. If, it, if it's not perfect, you go a little bit slower. So that's my approach to it. But I think um, performance, and then eventually, if you want to perform at a high level, you have to practice going fast. If you can't do it going fast, you won't ever get to that high level. So to pass level three exam, to pass level four exam, you have to ski fast. And if you don't, then you're not going to pass. So from my perspective, you eventually have to get to a fast speed. Um, and how you get to that fast speed, I would suggest the way that JF does it. A little bit faster, a little bit faster, a little bit faster. And then if, if, if it works, keep going faster. If it doesn't work, go a little bit slower, a little bit slower, a little bit slower until it works. And when I say works, I mean technically is good. So there's a balance that we have on the level three and level four exams. We have a teeter-totter tactic which we ask on the exams that you ski fast or technique so if somebody goes down the level four ski off run and goes really fast then it's amazing but it's technically not very perfect but they went really really fast then you might pass but also if if uh, you went fast but the technique was really bad then you're going to fail but then if you have perfect technique but you go too slow you don't meet the objective of the run you also fail so it's important to find that balance yeah, and also like you, sometimes if you too slow, a lot of feeling of performance, you have no way to performance. Yes, yes. Now I, I warm up slow. I actually try to go as slow as I can because it's really hard to ski very, very slow with a round arc. It's very difficult to do. And so that's my warm up every single day. That's how I start my day and it's very round and and very precise. And that's the way that I get my mind warmed up and my body warmed up. And I train slow a lot. You'll see me ski under the lift and it'll be very, very slow. And then two runs later, you'll see me go as fast as I can. And that's just mixing it up to challenge both myself cognitively and physically. Okay. Uh, Lulu. Lulu, you raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, uh I got the, the the better the best takeaway today. I got is uh, uh, when we talk about a muscle memory, it's not really about a muscle. It's a neural system memory. Yeah. So it's neurological. It's there theoretically. Uh, this um, so we train. Let's say we we acquire a new new movement pattern. We go from conscious training. So this is a kind of a brain tell us how, how to do it. And then mm -hmm. the goal, next goal will be make it more subconsciously. So it's, it becomes a part of the um, neural system memory. You don't yeah. have to think about it, but still it, it's built in, in into your neural system memory, right? Yes. And that, so remember I said there was initiation, acquisition, consolidation, um, refinement and create creation. When, mm -hmm. when we go through, oh, uh, so when we go through each of those, so when you're in initiation, you have to consciously think about what your body is doing. You have to say, okay, beginner skier, it's, I've got to move my foot and I have to think about moving my foot. It's not going to happen. When you get into refinement and then create variation, the very top level, that's when it should be automatic. Your brain actually when you're at that level doing a task that you have mastered, it should happen automatically. There should be no, you shouldn't have to consciously think about, okay, I'm gonna turn my foot now. And the only time where you might become conscious is if you get into a, a novel situation where maybe the, there's a rock or a, um, a, a, there's no bumps or there's a big bump in the middle of the run, then you have to consciously go, oh, what am I gonna do with this? But generally your body will come up with a solution when you get to that level. So that's the difference. You'll know your create variation level if you can ski and you don't need a coach at the bottom. You know, you have a sense of, did it go well? Did I achieve the outcome? Did I have good grip? Did I ski fast? Did I ski round? Did I feel that? And if you felt out of control, then you didn't achieve that. Yeah. Right, exactly. And this, uh, the topic today about imaginary visualization exercise or drill, does help on each stage of this, right? It does. It moves, you, 
yeah, it'll move you through those stages more quickly. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to end this Zoom meeting. Everyone had a great weekend. Yes. Stay bye -bye. safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye.